Hi, this is Steve at blessedhopeforever.com. We are studying together in the letter to the Galatians. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the greatness of your love and the blessings that you've bestowed upon us. Thankful for the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this time and be our only teacher, filtering out that which is foolish, that which is ignorant, that which is from the flesh, but sealing to our hearts that which is the truth of thy precious word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I believe in our last study, we were uh, together, we were in the area of verse 11 and 12 of chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 11. The Holy Spirit is writing to the churches of Galatia concerning a synergistic gospel. If ever there were an epistle that applies to the present age, it would be Galatians. But when I say that, I have to suggest that it applies to every age. The attacks of Satan against the truth of God's Word have always been from two standpoints. One is to discredit the Scriptures, to point out that they may contain the Word of God, but they're not entirely the Word of God. They're not infallible, that they contain error, that they contain things that that could be subtracted with absolute safety and, and maybe should be. And the other point of attack is to add works to the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is more than clear to me that I was born into an age where that these two attacks continue when one of our leading evangelists would say to a news reporter, that he hopes his works are, are were su sufficient for him to get into heaven. And so every day I wake up here, I wonder what has happened to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news that he who knew no sin was made sin for you, that you would be made the righteousness of God in him. You're made the righteousness of God, not by your works, not by anything you do, not by your faith, not by your trust, or anything else, but by the finished work of Jesus Christ. The churches of Galatia had apparently been taught that what Christ did was really super, it was really great, that it, it begins a, a process, that He provided a potential deliverance, but not an exact deliverance and that they must add to it with works, circumcision and uh, keeping of the law and so forth. And so the Holy Spirit has used Paul to give us the Word of God concerning the good news, the death of Jesus Christ in our place. The Holy Spirit is at the present point of our study certifying the apostleship of the Apostle Paul. I guarantee you, brethren, I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which I preached when I was here before, whenever that was, on one of his missionary journeys, it's, it's an aorist participle, which I preached when I was here before is absolutely not after man. The word not there is, is in the Greek, the absolute negative. It is absolutely not after man. And I pointed out last week in our study that all other religions are. They may be religions that worship idols and demons, as the Word of God says, but they're man's logic and they're all synergistic. Everyone, every single so-called religion is a philosophy of what one does to gain merit with the God, whoever that is, whoever that God happens to be. 
Christianity is not that. It, it cannot properly be called a religion. Christianity is the grand news that you who were totally depraved and unable to do anything acceptable to God were made righteous because Jesus Christ died in your place. Boy, is that good news. And that's the good news that Paul preached when he was there before. <clears throat> and that gospel is not after man. Man's logic would never come up with such a gospel. My dad, he uh, pounded into me for years that anything worth having was worth working for. Anything that you got free, you ought to throw away. Anything anybody would give you, don't take it. If it's worth having, it's worth working for. That is man's logic. That's earthly logic. We're not talking about something earthly here, but heavenly. The gospel that he preached is not after man's reasoning and not after man's logic. It is God's revelation. That's heavenly, not earthly, and that's where we are both in our study as well as in our lives. Verse 12, For I did not receive it from man, along with man. It isn't anything I was taught by man or anything I received from man. I wasn't taught it. I wasn't given it, but by means of... The word by there in your English translation is dia. By means of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Or through. Dia sometimes means through. And we're now faced with a genitive. This is either the revelation about Jesus Christ or it is Jesus Christ's revelation. So we have to translate the genitive. That man didn't teach me this and I wasn't given this by man. I wasn't taught and I didn't receive it from man, but I received it from Jesus Christ. It's not the revelation about Jesus Christ. It's the revelation that Jesus Christ gave to Paul. And Paul isn't arguing here for any, any brilliance on his part, any special gifts on his part at all, like you hear so much today, other than the fact that he received from Jesus Christ a special revelation. For that reason, there are some who believe that all of, well, maybe I should back up. It, it's easy to say that all of our doctrine comes from Paul. You know, when you use the Old Testament Scriptures to illustrate or highlight doctrine, for example, the Passover. The Passover, dearly beloved, is a beautiful illustration of the redemption that's ours in Christ Jesus when we didn't ask for it, didn't work for it, didn't deserve it. But you would not get that doctrine by studying the Passover. Once you get the doctrine, you can see the illustration in the Passover. And there are thousands of such illustrations. That's why the Old Testament is profitable to us for reproof and for instruction and righteousness and for doctrine because it highlights the doctrine. But you as Christians got all of your doctrine from those epistles that the Holy Spirit used Paul to write. And that in particular makes Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. And the argument of the Holy Spirit so far is that we have every right to conclude that Paul has apostolic authority. He didn't give me apostolic authority. But he gave that to Paul. Your revelation concerning Jesus Christ comes from the Word of God. Your study of this book. But Paul's was a special revelation from Jesus Christ Himself. The other apostles, uh, of course, they fellowshiped with the Lord for some number of years. They were taught of the Lord while He was here as a man. He, he was also God, but here incarnate as man. But Paul received a revelation specially from Christ, glorified from heaven after His resurrection. So there is a uniqueness about the apostleship of Paul. It's true that the apostles did fellowship with the Lord on 
on the shores of the Sea of Galilee after his resurrection. They still saw him in the body. Paul's special revelation came from the glorified Christ. Now, now God has completed his work. That's why you're whiter than snow. Because your sins aren't covered. They're gone. When they're covered, the snow melts or the snow gets dirty and it doesn't look as good as it did. You know, our place around here in the wintertime, on the rare occasions it does snow, which is not very often, but when it does, our place looks gorgeous with snow on it, but the snow, it melts, then it's covered with broken limbs and some paper that blew off of, of the trash and a couple of beer bottles somebody threw out of their, their vehicle. The snow's all gone. Your sins are not covered so that when the snow melts, they are there, they're gone. They're removed. As far as the east is from the west, sought for or not found, buried in the deepest sea, washed as white as snow, dearly beloved, gone. Gone. And this is a special revelation of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul got it directly from our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 13, For you have heard of my conversation in past time, in time past. The, the heard there is an aorist. It's punctiliar in point, but it says that, yeah, they heard this. They knew full well. You have heard of my manner of life. The word conversation, if you have the authorized version, my manner of life in past time it was in past time, the word in is epsilon nu. In the, in the Jews' religion, that word Jews' religion is articulated in the Greek. And it's one word, Judaism, would be almost a, a transliteration of the Greek word uh, Judaismos, Judaism, Judaism, all right? Judaism is not the Mosaic law. God called Moses up in the mount and gave him a copy of the Ten Commandments. The basis of our law here in this country, or at least so, you know, at least for now, is, is based on that. God gave it to Moses. Now man sat down, took these Ten Commandments and some of the civil commandments that the Lord or, or regulations that the Lord gave, and they wrote 400 volumes the size of Gone with the Wind about what God wanted man to do. And they set up fence laws to where you didn't get anywhere near to breaking God's law. They, they defined a Sabbath day's journey. They, they defined what work was. In Leviticus chapter 13, on the Day of Atonement, you do absolutely no work. Why then would one of our leading evangelists say, I hope my works are sufficient to get me into heaven? Dearly beloved, any work you do is filthy. This is filthy rags. Thou shalt do no work, no work, no work. You ought to read those passages. Why does God say that so emphatically? No work, no work, no work. Because anything man does would defile it. Well, the Judaizers said, well, you know, we ought to define work. And work, well, everybody knows what work is. That's a, that's a force that operates over a distance. If you push very hard against the wall and it doesn't move at all, you, you might be fatigued, but you've done no work. You may have exerted force, but until you've moved the mass, you've done no work. So the Jews, they knew that. They knew that you don't have to know Newton's laws of physics to define work. They, they knew what, the, what ergos was. The word work is ergos. They knew what ergos was. So if you spit and it lands on a rock, you know, it, it didn't move anything, so that's okay. That's okay. You, you can spit on Sunday as long as your spit don't land on a rock. As long as it doesn't land in the dust where it, that it plows a little small furrow because that would be work. And folks, that is insane. Yet that's, that's what they thought. And you are now headed for hell if you did that. And they wrote 400 volumes of this stuff. They put burdens on man that no man could bear. The Lord said that. Now that's what this word Jews religion means. Many have said that refers to the Ten Commandments. It doesn't. 
Paul wasn't, Paul, listen, Paul was not going around putting people to death because they broke the Ten Commandments. Not at all. He was pushing the traditions of his fathers. You've heard of my manner of life in times past in the Jews' religion, in Judaism. You could translate it in Judaism. That's the word. That's the word, Judaism. In Judaism, how that beyond measure, beyond measure, that beyond measure, it's our English word hyperbole. It's where we get the word hyperbole, hyperbole. To an exaggerated degree, I persecuted the church of God and I wasted it. And now we have another genitive. And I believe the genitive is similar to the genitive in verse 12. This is God's church. God's church. It's not a church that teaches about God. It's God's church. Well, that's interesting. The Holy Spirit is now not talking about Israel, God's chosen people, but about God's church. And the word church, believe it or not, is a complicated word. We throw that word around so loosely today. That is not the National Council of Churches. It's not Roman Catholicism. It's not the Pope. It's, it's not even the combined Christian ministries that span the globe. But it is a living organism. The body of Christ on earth. Both living and dead. It's not an organization. It's not a brick and mortar or wood or pole barn or whatever or strip mall church or whatever building. None of those meanings are this word, although it's the same word. Ecclesia, a group of called out ones. This is God's church and it's composed of saints, His people that He chose before the foundation of the world and that those He made righteous in Christ through no merit, no merit of their own. You know that beyond measure, I persecuted the church of God and wasted it. Devastated is, is the word, and it's an imperfect tense. Imperfect. The imperfect describes an action that was going on in, the past, in past time, but it was never completed. That's the imperfect tense. The imperfect tense describes an action going on in past time, but it never reaches completion so he did not destroy the church of God, but he was in the activity of destroying it, but he never completed that destruction. That's what he was doing from our frame of reference. And Christians are doing that same thing today. Think, think of the worst sin you know, that you can think of. Uh, let's say that, that would be adultery or murder. You know, interesting how nobody in the Bible died for those reasons. David, he flagrantly committed, openly committed adultery. But bear in mind, David was an old, old man and, and Bathsheba, you know, was obviously an, an exhibitionist. But, but those points all aside, he did commit adultery and there's no excuse for it. And then he connived the murder of her husband and he was still king of Israel. Man, we can't have a king like that. I mean, we argue about our presidents. But God maintained David as Israel's king and said that David was a man after his own heart. Except in the case of Uriah. But Nadab and Abihu, all they did was add a little Baal worship to God worship and, and God struck them dead. Samson marries outside his tribe, which broke the law. Uzzah, all he did was reach out to stabilize the ark and he was struck dead. Surely God is teaching us, folks, that theological error is much, much, much more worse than carnal error. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul is the chief of sinners. I don't know how many times I've heard Christians discuss that verse you know, I'll, I'll bet Paul never committed adultery. I'll bet Paul never murdered anybody. Boy, I can think of a lot worse sinners than Paul. How many 
can you think of that beyond measure persecuted God's church? Man, you shouldn't touch that which is God's. Nadab and Abihu did, and they died instantly. Uzzah did, and he was struck dead. Ananias and Sapphira did, and they died. And the young men had to carry their bodies out and bury them. Christians today don't even think what these guys did was bad. Roman Catholicism is a, you know, is a devilish system, but it's not the people. It, we have our brothers and sisters in that system. It's not the people. It's the doctrine. Paul touched the church of God in Nahab and Abihu's case and Uzzah's case and Ananias and Sapphira's case. They were struck dead, but Paul did it ignorantly in unbelief. Nahab and Abihu were not in unbelief. They were, they, were, they were graduates of Dallas Theological Seminary. You know, Nahab and, and Abihu, was, they, were, they were from Wheaton, but, but Uzzah wasn't doing it ignorantly in unbelief. He was chosen by God to help bring up the ark of Jehovah. And Ananias and Sapphira were members of the church bringing their offerings to the Lord. Paul did it ignorantly in unbelief. But nobody, nobody ever wasted the church of God like Paul. That's why he's chief of sinners. You're not. Okay? And the problem with Christians today is they have the wrong idea of sin. They, they list what's bad and what isn't bad. You know, we, we, we get down to, to speeding or cheating on our income tax. That's, that's not too bad. Everybody does that, you know. Or what we normally find out is what other Christians do is really bad. What we do, it's, it's, really, it's not that bad. And we've cataloged sin. And I believe that the Word of God is absolutely clear that that which touches the heart of God is that which persecutes and wastes that which is His. And Paul, he could not complete. Thank God he couldn't complete that destruction. But that's what he was trying to do. And the Holy Spirit is not wasting any words here. This man really did it. Nobody did it like he did it. That's why he's called the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy chapter 1. There's more of, of 1 Timothy 1 in this chapter. And I progressed, verse 14. I made progress in Judaism. And I want you to clearly understand this is not the Ten Commandments. This is not God's law given to Moses. This is the law of the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests and the lawyers who've added all this horse hockey, sorry, you know, with the idea that this kind of care, this critical examination of the law of God is what makes them good. When the very scriptures they so meticulously copied and, and cared for, so zealously guarded, said that the justification the justified man lives by God's faithfulness. And I made progress in Judaism beyond, above. It's our, it's our Greek word, huper. Many, many my own age, my Bible says. My equals. The Greek identifies that principally as age. Many my own age in my own nation. I believe the Holy Spirit is saying in verse 14 that not one young man studying Judaism excelled beyond Paul. He was guy number one. Nobody excelled beyond Paul because he was more exceedingly zealous for Moses' law. Right? No, absolutely not. For the tradition of my fathers, he says. And you can read that verse and say, that, well, that's ridiculous. Why would anybody get involved in tradition? But that's, that's Romanism, and that's modern Protestantism, modern Christianity in the main today. Now uh, you can, I, I suppose you can argue, well, you know, the church fathers didn't have pianos. You know, if they sang at all, they sang a cappella. You know, they didn't have a Sunday school. They gathered together to study the Word of God. Well, you know, so that's, that's all we should do, and you know, 
well, but they didn't have air conditioning either. They didn't have electric lights. They didn't have soft chairs. They didn't have PowerPoint or, or, or internet or, or YouTube. You know, I mean, if we're going to do this tradition stuff, man, we got to really go back to the beginning there. You know, well, if that was true, then I wouldn't be doing this. Probably they didn't have much heat. I don't know if they built a fire in a fireplace or, uh, I don't know. That's, that's crazy logic. What did the church fathers think? What did, they, what did they think? Now, don't be shocked by this, but folks, I don't care what they thought. I really don't. It is so precious to study and read the Word of God. It's hard for me to do that. Uh, I'm... I'm concerned about what God's Word says. I don't want to teach error. Uh, these men were not infallible. This book is infallible. You can't have a greater high than to hold in your hand the infallible inspired Word of the Almighty God, Creator of heaven and earth. And it's a privilege that we take so lightly. So lightly. You know, what a precious privilege to feast on what God said. Don't, do not, dearly beloved, believe what I say. That's, that's nothing, absolutely nothing compared to what God says. Paul's focus was on the tradition of his fathers. I am not in any way suggesting that I have not been blessed by the studies of other men. I praise God for those who dedicated their lives to study so that I might grow. You know, this book is worth reading. Paul was absolutely wrapped up in the tradition of his fathers. Verse 15. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me. Well, we're going to rein it in right here, but I must say this. Uh, when it pleased God, not, be, not because of any merit in Paul, the language can only be when it was God's good pleasure, His good pleasure, totally based upon what God had decided to do, not what Paul decided to do, who separated me for Himself before I was born. That's what the phrase says, before I was born. It doesn't say that when I was in my mother's womb, He called me. It doesn't, doesn't say that. He separated me absolutely for Himself before I was ever born. He knew me before I was born. You, you were chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. That's before you were born. Why then did Paul spend 50 years persecuting the church of God and wasting it? Why? Imagine the uh, study to excel beyond anyone his own age in the tradition of his fathers. One of the things that he had to do was his instructor would roll up the first five books of the Bible in a scroll, they'd drive a nail through it, and they'd tell him what Hebrew word it went through on the first roll of the scroll. And he had to tell them, the Hebrew word that the nail went through on all the other layers. That's some diligent study. It didn't have anything to do with the vicarious suffering of Jesus Christ in your place, but, but that's, that's the kind of diligent study that he, Paul went through. And that's what he later went on to consider rubbish as compared to knowing Christ. Now, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Why would God have Dr. Strong spend 75 years coming up with Strong's Concordance when you can buy a simple Bible program that runs rings around a Strong Concordance? I don't know, but I believe that we have a verse that we have a verse that says God was preparing Paul for exactly the work that he had laid out for him. And what Paul needed, what Paul needed was real schooling in a synergistic redemption so that he could forcefully and loudly and boldly preach a non-synergistic redemption. 
God ordered his life. God ordained his life. And God knew him before he was ever born. We'll talk next week. We'll talk next week uh, about revealing his son in me. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Please continue to, to lift up Sue and I in prayers. Uh, things are getting better for Sue as she uh, undergoes the treatment that she's going through uh, right now after having fallen on, on the 10th of June. Uh, it turned out to not be quite as bad as, as, as we thought it was. And so I just know that that's a result of, of your prayers, that things are, are looking up. Uh, please pray for me as well in this ministry, the direction of it. Until next time, rest in Him. And thanks for watching.